Our next talk is Hack the Gadget by Daniel aka Cyrivolt. Um, hey. Yeah, please give him a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, do you want to start? Yes. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about something today which other people have talked about in the past. I already wrote that in, in the abstract. And so we will find some things which you might have heard of or seen before. But I want to give some new perspectives and we're going to see about that in a bit. Um, but first of all, I would like to see some hands. So who of you here is a hacker? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing hands. Okay, who, who is like a, like a true hacker, like a, like a real hacker? Like an underground hacker, like an elite hacker. You're so elite, you don't even know how to spell elite. You use digits. Okay, I will ask you for help next time when I need some. Um, <laughs> jokes aside, uh, uh, let's actually dive right in now. So there is a very small agenda I have prepared. We will have three sections. The first one will be just about some hacks other people have done in the past from like about 10 years ago. Then I will be talking about something that people always call routing or obtaining root, you know. But I want to go a bit further than that, and I will talk about that in a bit. And then I will talk a bit more about understanding hardware. So when you buy a device, how you can actually understand your device a bit more. So yeah, let, let's start with what happened in the past. There was this very, very nice talk. Hack all the things, 20 devices in 45 minutes. Who of you has seen this talk? Okay, I'm seeing a few hands. That is good. Um, so, but I'm not seeing everybody's hands, so let's briefly talk about it. Uh, there was a group, they were called the Exploiteers. I think they're still sort of uh, maybe around, I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, they gave a talk at DEF CON 22. 22 is not the number of the year. Uh, the year was actually 2014, so I guess it was like the 22nd DEF CON. Um, it's a conference uh, famously held in Las Vegas these days. I'm not sure if they moved around or something, uh, but yeah, it just happened uh, again just a few weeks ago anyways. So yeah, also a very nice uh, event if you want to hear about cool hacks, uh, go check that out. So yeah, they gave a group presentation, like four or five people maybe, uh, they were quickly walking through like all these devices they hacked. If you just think about it, 20 devices, 45 minutes, that would mean like one device had two minutes of showtime, sort of. Uh, but they not only presented devices, so they talked about, first of all, different kinds of devices, like it could be cameras or TV boxes, stuff like that, or smart light bulbs. Um, some people these days know if you buy one of those things, it's actually not that smart and usually more prone to error than anything. Um, but, you know, they actually wanted to see, okay, how can we hack into those things? And they looked at things like USB serial converters. They are very, very cheap these days. Almost everybody has one. Uh, to those who don't have one, get one. Uh, it's always useful at some point. Uh, they also talked about different storage devices like eMMC and embedded sort of MMC storage. Well, and in the end, they actually had a live act, even dual core. It's a, like a rap group. Uh, they have the very nice song, All the Things. So if you want to get in that mood, I would really want to recommend watching that talk and especially enjoying the end of it. Um, oh, there were actually other people who did this even before them. And that was, for example, Matt Evans. That was in 2012, so that was just two years before the exploit years. And he talked at LinuxConf. So it's a different setting. It's not a hackers conference, but it's you know more of like one of these open source conferences. We have lots of overlaps, but still certain differences. And he was more talking about, OK, what can you actually do with the devices that you have? So like hacking into them is funny, but you know, we want to see if we can actually reuse things. So he was, and that is citing from the slides here, he was actually saying, don't just consume, reconsume. Make something out of your devices. If you discover something cool, he said, show it to other people in the world, teach them about it, talk to them, collaborate in hackerspaces, like many of us actually do. So yeah, also reference here. Now another cool thing that was actually also presented at DEF CON, but also those two years earlier, in 2012, was John Florin. And John Florin was working at Sandia Labs back then. Um, they were walk working on an operating system that I think not too many people know. Who of you has heard of Inferno? I'm seeing two hands. OK. Uh, who of you has heard of Plan 9? 
I'm seeing a few more hands. Okay, well, actually, half of the hands are going up. Uh, props to you. So, Inferno is actually a derivative of the Plan 9 operating system, which was a research operating system. And they put it on that phone, so they actually ran it in Linux user space instead of the Android big, big runtime, right? So, they wanted to have something a bit smaller, and they experimented with that. Highly recommend it. Also, look at that talk. So, but that was like more than 10 years ago. People are still doing this kind of stuff. So last year there was an article like people were taking an old smartphone, not as fast as the ones that we use today. And they thought, hey, well, at least it could do something more useful now than just you know lying in the corner. So let's use it for weather display. A very simple application. Of course, you can use a phone for that. It doesn't need high performance or anything, right? Just display the weather. The industry is also doing that thing, right? So <laughs> some people might have seen that tweet at some point where you know they were using some old Palm system to, well, control something. I think that was in a theater or something. And then well, at some point they put it on an emulator. I guess they lost the hardware, but they still had the software or something. I'm not sure. So yeah, a, a very fun one. Um, sorry. Well, I'm also doing that sort of stuff, uh, but I'm not really sure if I'm doing that sort of stuff or maybe something else. So, uh, what you see here, it looks like two cute robots. It's actually cameras, which I got from AliExpress, just like a lot of other stuff. So, you know, this thing happened a few years ago, uh, and people were sort of locked into their homes. And just before that, I actually started looking into a bunch of things. And then, well, at some point, I discovered there is lots of cheap cameras that you can buy off AliExpress. So gamification came into play. I became a Diamond member in AliExpress at some point for whatever reason. I guess I just bought too much stuff. So yeah, there are some people, you know, uh, making this meme of a platinum customer. But you know, if you really just keep buying things, AliExpress will actually push you more and more and more, and you need to buy more and more. Uh, but that's not what I'm here for. So I coined that term at some point. I call it root on arrival. So it's a bit like dead on arrival, but you know. So what is the first thing that you do? when you buy something, you get a new device, what is the first thing you do? Well, up, yeah? Unpack it. Unpack it, yes. Disassemble. Disassemble, yes. So yeah, this is how the day starts. The bell rings, a uh, very nice uh, postman is coming, bringing me a new box, a package arrives. I unwrap it, I solder a wire to something I find somewhere inside, I attach my serial converter to it, boom, I got root access. I hack the device. Actually, I didn't really do much, right? So that is like a one-minute effort, literally. So most of these devices are actually very easy to disassemble. So mostly you can discover screws. Sometimes one of them is behind one of those uh, quality check stickers or something. Very simple. And yeah, so now you have a root shell. OK, you could type commands or something. Does it give you anything useful? Well, you can get some information out of the hardware. So you can explore a bit around. You can maybe see a bit more information about the system currently running there, and maybe also some of the peripherals. And then this stuff happens. So that was the beginning this year, I think, in like March or something. Um, somebody found malware on TV boxes. So they made a GitHub repo, and they said, well, if you have one of those nice boxes here, they are called T95 or you know some other variants. Uh, some are based on chips by all winners, some are based on rock chip. And you have certain files, well, then it might be that it's actually infected by malware. So um, what do we do with that? Uh, we got new motivation again, so now we want to get rid of that malware. So in that repository, there is actually some information on you know removing the malware. It's essentially what you know virus cleaners do or something like that. So now you have a TV box, you have malware on it, you remove the malware. Okay, now you could use it as an actual TV box. Well, what happens with the TV box? Nothing usually, because the vendor would never maintain it, right? So you would never receive updates or anything. At some point, it will turn into malware again because it's connected to the internet and people, you know, figure out their way. So you don't really want that, actually. Um, so the question is, can we get beyond that? 
So, well, first of all, uh, coincidentally, because I collected so much stuff, I also got some TV boxes, like uh, this one here. Uh, it might be a bit less suspicious, because it already has the wires routed out here. Uh, so I did that at some point, so I don't need to keep it open. And these are the wires where we could attach our USB serial converters. So I was sitting in our hackerspace that was in Essen, and, you know, I was playing around a bit, and at some point I told people, hey, look here, I have this box, and, you know, asked people uh, if they wanted to play around with it, and, well, well, things happened. Um, <laughs> we now actually have a bunch of people who are interested in this stuff, and well, we're hacking all the things, literally. And now let's see if we can get beyond this point of we just have root shell access, we can type commands. Let's see what else we can do. So, the first thing we discover is if you keep searching a bit more, there is lots of gadgets that we have which are actually based on development boards that are also freely available, like you can just buy them off the shelf. And if you can identify the platform and you see, hey, it's essentially the same hardware, you know, you get another starting point. So. Here's another TV box I have, and now you can see it's actually a bit more prepared. So uh, I have the USB, sorry, I have the USB serial converter here hooked up, right? So it's already attached to the wires. Here you also see wires coming out, so it's essentially the same as the other box. It's just based on a different chip. Uh, there's this funny USB cable here. Uh, it has USB-A on both ends. Uh, you can actually buy those cables. I have it right here. Um, they are very, very useful also because they give you access to some very, very special features which we are going to explore in a bit. Um, another thing I attach here is, well, just a network adapter. If I had one, you know, in my laptop these days, they sometimes don't have them, then I could attach it directly, but, you know, here I needed this adapter. Anyway, so this is now my development setup, and I can actually use that to load my own code to that device and run it completely. And this is what we're going to do now. So the first thing is we're going to talk about talking to the SOC or a system on a chip. That is the actual base hardware in the platform, right? So that is like the central piece. It's sort of what a CPU was at some point, but then, you know, people kept adding more stuff into the same package, and now they call it SOC. So it's like CPU cores alongside everything else that you would have, like a UART, for example, to give the serial output. All of that stuff is just beyond the, uh, behind that package. Sometimes it can even be RAM, like, you know, actual DRAM. Not too much, some megabytes, but it's sufficient for many, many applications. So yeah, why should we stop at the operating system level, right? So we want to go a bit deeper. We want to hack into the system like real hackers do, right? So let's build our own systems. Let's put those on the hardware because it's actually feasible. So, you know, just get the reference platform that your device is based on, figure out what vendor is behind it, what specific chip it is, and there are good chances that you actually find something in like upstream Linux, for example, or U-Boot, and you can just use that code right away. Now, the thing is, it's still not too feasible for a single person, so I want to encourage you to exchange with other people. There are many communities out there. We have our hackerspaces. We have the culture to, you know, actually get to that point. And, you know, just like the exploiters did, they were also a group of people, right? So like four or five, maybe six, I don't know. We also can gather in smaller groups, maybe start with one, two people, and, you know, at some point, maybe somebody else will join the effort, and then you can actually get to very, very interesting points. And that actually happened with lots of projects that we have. So, yeah, I also did that in part, so I created an article in the Linux Sunshi wiki uh, that is a special wiki dedicated to all chips made by Allwinner. So Allwinner is a chip vendor, and you know, their other name is Sunshi. So if you find that name, it's the same thing. Um, I found this stuff. Uh, they call it a car media player. I actually have it right here. Uh, I sometimes put it upside down because then you can put it on the table, but nevertheless, so it's designed for, you know, just sitting somewhere in the front of your car, and then you could mirror your Android phone or iOS device, whatever, to that, and then see a larger map, you have a bit more screen real estate. That is very nice. You could also play media on it, like, I don't know, your favorite music, then you don't need to 
touch on your very tiny phone, you can actually use that to control things. I still don't encourage people you know, doing that while driving, but maybe when you're stopping for a moment or whatever. Um, Anyway, so this thing has a very, very specific purpose, but I mean, I don't really have to put that in my car. Why not just put it, I don't know, somewhere in my living room, use it as a control panel for something else, right? So even that is available as single special purpose devices, but these are actually all the same things in a way. If you look at the product details here, this one uh, was actually quite nice. So it was saying the CPU is a F133, has anyone heard of that name before? Well, uh, coincidentally, I have, because I was involved in another project where we actually dealt with that. Um, they were saying it has a gigabit of DRAM memory in it, uh, resolution of the screen 1024 by 600. Um, well, it's not all true. So some of that is actually a lie. So I know that chip is also known as D1S. It's a, it's a chip from all winner. There are two variants of it, that is not too important, but you know, it's basically a chip by all winner. It has 512 megabits of DRAM in it, or 64 megabytes. 64 megabytes, it doesn't really sound that much, does it? But you can actually still do a lot with that. So 64 megabytes um, is more than sufficient for many, many things, just like putting a stupid picture on the screen, right? And especially with the all window hardware, so they already have like very, very specific blocks in the SLC itself, which is suitable for display, LCD, whatever attachment, you know, all of that stuff. So, yeah, let, let's see if we can do that. I would like to show a little demo now, and I will need a volunteer who is brave enough to assist me for just a few seconds. Okay, I will take you. So um, now I've turned that screen, you might see there are these uh, very, very uh, nice looking wires here. Um, and so I will need you as an assistant, I, I will need you to hold those wires. I will already plug this here in, like this. Okay. So I will need you to short those wires. So you just need to have the metal touching, right? Like this. So I will turn it on and boom. <laughs> Just kidding. Nothing happened. Okay, you can release again. So <laughs> that was okay. Thank you. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, now, now this uh, device is plugged in here. Uh, usually, you would get the 12 volts supplied from your car, right? So you have those. Uh, some people use that for disgusting stuff, but you can also use it to supply power to your electronics in a car. Um, now, now it's wired up to something else. This is now a 5 volt uh, source, but 5 volts are actually enough for this stuff. So uh, let's, let's see what happens now. So I have prepared something. Uh, I hope it's going to work. So we actually just sat down on Wednesday evening and I said, hey, uh, can we actually get a picture on this thing here? Um, who of you is a fan of the Rust programming language? Who knows the mascot, Ferris? How about we just magically get Ferris to appear on this screen here after just a few seconds? I'm not sure if we can actually see this, but there you go. So people in the front row will actually recognize we got Ferris on the screen here. It's running no operating system. That was just our code doing this stuff, which is you know just a tiny program. Um, I actually didn't even write it myself. Uh, Adam Greig wrote it, so he's uh, you know also in the Rust embedded development community. Anyway, so um, that was the first demo, and it worked, which is nice. If you are interested in this stuff, uh, I will briefly zoom in here and show you the URL. Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, there is a branch. It's called CMP Hack, CMP for Car Media Player, because that's what they call the device. Yeah, Adam Greig made the original one, and I made some adjustments for this stuff because it has a different resolution uh, than the original demo. All right. So we we can talk to this SLC, and this just works because All Winner has a protocol in there. You know, and you can just talk to it over USB. So what else can we do with this? Well, oh good, oh good. Uh, phones, phones are loud. Uh, you can turn it off. Um, <laughs> uh, 
before we dive deeper, we need to uh, talk about something for a very brief moment now. So um, I'm also doing things on a different platform sometimes, which is called something like lag, but something else. Um, there is a very nice person. Her name is Azeria. Who has heard of Azeria? Or Maria Markstetter. So she made a bunch of things. She raised a blog which is talking a lot about assembly on a specific platform I'm not going to name now. Well, or processor architecture. Um, she, uh, well, wrote a book at some point. She gave lots of like workshops and stuff like that. So that was at security conferences usually. Well, and then just uh, recently, uh, the company uh, related to it that, uh, well, it's actually the instruction set architecture said, um, how about it's our copyright and uh, maybe you shouldn't use our name anymore. So now there is lag-assembly.com. So if you want to buy that book, highly recommend it. Go to lag-assembly.com. Or if you want to learn a bit more about the assembly, uh, you know, you can still find it on azure-labs.com on that site. Okay, so this is also how I got to learn the ARM assembly just a few weeks ago when we were sitting again in our hackerspace. And I said, hey, uh, I got this other device here. Um, it's a different architecture than things I'm uh, used to. So let's see if we can also get some code on that. So let's talk a bit about assembly. Who of you has written a Hello World program? Who has written a Hello World program on bare metal? I'm seeing lots of fans. Excellent. So, here is the Hello World on Bell Metal and well, this specific architecture. So, what do we do here? Um, we just load a few values and we write some stuff out. So, the first thing we do is we load a value into a register, which is just an address somewhere in memory. Then we're loading a few characters. They are now in hex notation. And then we just write them out by saying stir. So stir is for storing to memory. LDR is for loading to memory. Um, you might ask why I'm using the load to uh, memory or load from memory here. Uh, it's just a constraint of the architecture. In other architectures, it could also be an immediate value. Then you know. Anyway, so we're going to run this program now on uh, this device here, based on this other architecture by the vendor. I'm not going to name. Well. The chip itself is also made by Allwinner again, so we can use very similar tools to what we had before. So we're going to do something now which is called MMIO or memory mapped IO. So I have a USB serial converter attached here. This USB serial converter essentially just, um, you know, translates the UART to something that I can now print here. So yeah, I can literally attach it via USB. Um, so, yeah, I will connect to the UART here now. And, well, we're going to do two steps here. So, the first thing is we're going to use a hacked up U boot. So, who of you knows the U boot project? Very famous bootloader. Okay, almost everyone has heard about it. To those who don't know it, well, it's a bootloader essentially. But I'm not going to use the bootloader. I'm going to use a part which is also known as SPL or secondary program loader and that is in U-Boot what initializes the DRAM controller. And I'm going to do that mostly because it coincidentally also sets up the serial port so I already have it set up and I can just run that assembly code that I wrote otherwise I would need to you know do a bit more of a dance. Okay, so we're going to run this and while I'm doing that I will push a magic button here. Um, Paper clips help with that. And I need to keep it pressed again for uh, specific reasons. And now here on the right hand side, you see magic output. So you see U-boot something something, DRAM 256 megabytes, uh, YOLO. That is my indicator, so I see that it's actually my own code running here. And now I'm going to say make run. And hopefully, we're going to see something like MRMCD. Uh, well, this is a bit of a bummer, so I'm actually not sure what's happening here because it's literally just a hack I did, so this will now fail a few times. I will try it again. It will fail again. And when I'm going to try it for a third time, we will see the magic happen, I hope. Um, please, please don't ask me why this is the case because it's, it's really just a hack and MRMCD. There we go. So here is how I did this. So 
This is not really what U-Boot is designed for. I actually don't even know too much about U-Boot. Um, I just put something in U-Boot which would do the DRAM initialization and then jump back to the mass chrome, which is what is actually the code that is even running before any software code is running because it's actually hard-coded into the chip. And that will get me back into that mode again where I can talk to it over USB. And that is why I had to keep this button pressed twice. Then weird things happen. I don't even know the internals of that stuff, but you know, after like three attempts, I can write to the chip again. All right. So, next up, uh, let's talk about kernel hacking. Uh, who of you has heard of Linux? Okay, stupid question, right? Everybody knows Linux. Uh, who has worked with Linux? Who has to work with a different system at work and would wish it wasn't something else? Okay, yeah, okay, I see. Lots of people have to work with something else than Linux, unfortunately. Uh, who would actually want to work with something different than Linux? Because it's cool to have something else. Like Plan 9 or Inferno, right? So, wh what I'm talking about here, all that stuff we can do means we can also just write our completely own operating system at some point. That is, of course, a bit more effort again, but you know, if you're interested in, th in that, um, there are lots of communities developing new operating systems still these days. Anyway, so we now did something with the so-called MMIO, so we wrote to the output just you know, directly through memory. And that is something which is very, very useful if you want to bring up a Linux kernel or anything else and you need an indicator whether your code is actually running. So that isn't always trivial. So yeah, I'm interested in bringing things up. So I started hacking into the Linux kernel at some point and I found this file which is called head.s. It's uh, in most architectures, so in Linux there is this directory structure, the arc directory, then the name of the architecture which could be, let's say, RISC-V or MIPS or something like that. There is a subdirectory called kernel, and in that you would find a head.s. And this one is like the architecture specific entry point. So this is literally the very first instructions before you see anything else from the Linux kernel. So if you want to make sure that this code is actually running, hey, why not just put the same code in there, which I just showed, and you know, just write to some serial port. If you need something else, or maybe you don't know where the serial port is yet, but you have something else, I not turn on an LED or, you know, whatever you have on your platform. Um, you just need to be a bit careful with registers because it can easily happen that you, you know, trip on them. So in the kernel setup, they actually have a specific meaning, right? So usually that is well commented. I found that to be the case for leg, for example. So <laughs> there were like, you know, some functions where they were saying, hey, this and that register is used for this and that purpose. So it's, it's not yet in the C world, where you know C is the programming language, you actually have very specific conventions for calling functions and stuff like that already. So you know we're already in early code. So yeah, just be a bit careful with that. There is another file which is called debug.s, which has some handy functions. So you can, for example, print addresses if you need that. So you can uh, print two, four, or eight-digit hex values. That is very, very useful sometimes. Like, you know, if you want to read something from memory and be sure it's actually what you found, or you want to print something which you find in a, in a register and you think this should actually be a specific memory address, you know, you can print that. Um, but then again, <laughs> you might trip into something again and you would actually leave the conventions of the setup. So, yeah, you might just want to do that, like, on demand and then turn it back off again. Well. At some point, you will be at the, you know, at that stage where your kernel is finally running, or at least partially running, and then it's time to share some log output. So there are a few things you can set up in Linux to get more verbose output. There is a thing which is called EarlyCon, which will set up the console even before the real console is set up, you know, just to get some very early output. Um, for um, the uh, parts which are based on something, um, you know, that is called 16550 or 8250, you know, that is from a very old semiconductor company. Um, many, many, many chips have UARTs based on that stuff. Uh, you can do this setup here. So you just need to know uh, your MMIO size. So on the platform I was on here, it was 32 bits. 
And then I could just give it the memory address of the UART. So if you know the memory address of the UART, you can do it exactly that and you will get very early console output. It's very, very helpful because otherwise you need to, you know, walk through all that setup again and you need to have the first drivers attached until you can finally get some output. So we're, we're still at this point where, you know, we don't actually have a full platform running yet. Um, if you want to have very verbose output, you can set the log level. I think seven might even be the maximum. I don't know. I always set it to eight. Um, it, it just needs to be larger than some number. Uh, there is an option which is called init call debug. So you can also give that to the kernel. All that goes into the kernel command line, and then you get lots of lots of output for tracing. And there are even more options if you go into the kernel configuration. You can, you know essentially get so much output that it might even be too much output to handle for, you know, the kernel itself because it doesn't even find enough memory. Um, yeah, sometimes you would need to tweak the value then, you know, and say, okay, for print buffering, you need to have, like, some more kilobytes or whatever. Anyway, so, yeah, I, I did that a bunch of times. And actually found someone else's logs at some point from the same platform I was on. Uh, that was a Pritzel, very famous also in the Sunchi community. Um, yeah, that really helped me at some point to get a bit further with my attempts. There are a few cool projects now which are focusing on certain products and I briefly want to walk through them because I, I think many people of you might know them or if you don't, they might be very interesting and they actually need to have exactly the tooling I just uh, talked about because it gets you a strong boost for your development effort. So some, you know, some platforms don't allow for this easy sort of access to the chip you know, they might ask you to, I don't know, put something on an SD card, you need to take out the SD card, put it back again, and, you know, stuff like that. It's very, very time-consuming and also frustrating. So, you know, if you work on one of those projects, maybe what I just uh, said can be very handy. So, first up, we have uh, OpenWRT, and I'm aware that we actually have a Perl talk here on OpenWRT, and I'm very sorry if somebody here is currently missing that talk or vice versa. It's a very, very cool project. Well, it's made for routers, so it started with uh, wireless routers mostly, but you know, you can also find it on other platforms sometimes. Um, there is actually also other projects like PFSense and OPNSense, which have similar goals. OpenWRT has a very excellent wiki. Well, and now we have a very, very specific project for a certain product, right? So. What else do we find? There is OpenIPC. I found that community when I was buying all of those cameras because what they do is the same thing that OpenWRT does for others, but for cameras. So, you know, they also have those specific applications that you would need, like, I, I don't know, zoom in or, you know, um, get the actual uh, image out of the camera and stuff like that, stream it to somewhere else. You know, those are the very specific applications that you need. Then we have the OpenBMC and UBMC projects. They are for baseboard management controllers. Um, if you ever operated a server and you know you had your operating system not yet provisioned or it was crashing or something, um, you, you might have used some BMC in some way, shape, or form. Uh, some vendors call it something else, like I don't know, ILO, for example, is the name that HP uses. Um, stuff like that. So there is also open source implementations of that, or at least efforts. And well. If you want to work in one of those projects, you would need to know how to talk to your chips, how to discover your hardware. So, yeah, highly encouraged. Um, go check those out. If you operate servers and you need some, uh, you know, I don't know, you need quicker setup or something, that might be useful. Or you just start a new project, right? So you can find lots of interesting products like uh, this uh, car media player thingy and you want to put your own system on it. So you can totally do that. Um, we have something which is called Uroot. So Uroot is, um, is a project that allows you to build a very, very, very small environment that you can use with the Linux kernel. So you have all the basic commands and you can also put your own command in there. It's just written in Go, so if you know the Go language, you can put something in there. But you can also use any other binary if you want. Um, we have a tool which is called CPU. Uh, more on that also in a bit. And the CPU tool, well, it actually allows you to talk to some hardware which you, you know, have somewhere on your network. And you can run commands that you actually only have on your own machine without having to set up something like NFS or, you know, some, some network uh, file system directly. 
uh, you can use that right away. And then we have a new project which is called Sidecore, which is similar, but yeah, I'm, I'm not going too much into detail now. Well, what I can tell you is because lots of the cameras I looked into are based on the lag platform, I actually, cre sorry, I actually created this repository here, um, you know, which has like uh, lots of interesting information if you want to hack on your camera. This here is how you build a small Linux system with a Euro tool. It's essentially it is really just that command here in the middle. So yeah, we'll just give you this here for reference. Uh, what I would just want to tell you with this is it's super dead simple to set this up. So you just build a very, very tiny thing. You can add that to your Linux configuration. You can say init ramfs. Here is my init ramfs source. You give it whatever comes out of this here and you have a small system running. So you have a kernel, you have a user land. All right, so um, we have one step to go further now. So the thing is, if you start bringing up a platform and you get like zero output, for example, that is very, very nice. But usually your hardware is a bit more complex, especially these days. If you look at a phone, for example, there's so much stuff on the platform, it's you know a bit harder to uh, get everything to work. So here's now a few things I ran into and that you know maybe it will also help you get further. So the first thing is a bit of understanding of firmware and operating system. So if you know the U-Boot project, they have a configuration just like the Linux kernel, it's just in a different place. And both of them are based on something which is called a device tree. A bit more on that in a bit which essentially describes your hardware. They also have that in slightly different directories for various reasons. And that is because what is a board, so like a, what we call main board sometimes, is a bit different from the view of the firmware than from the view of the kernel. Because from the firmware's point of view, you know, everything is a bit more centered around a certain specific vendor and SOC. But the kernel doesn't really uh, you know, it doesn't really care about the vendor of the SOC, it just concerns the ISA, so you want a portable kernel. So in this sense, you would need to have some different structure and instructions, and you know, that is why we have this structure here. Um, and well, for a kernel like Linux, for example, they actually can use the same view on hardware for different variants of the same board, because they actually have the very, very same chip underneath. They might have even most of the board uh, in common, except for minor details. Like, let's say, instead of an LCD, like a display, instead we have, I don't know, a microphone attached and some LEDs, right? So we would have a lot of duplicate code if we wanted to have a complete copy of the kernel or something. So we don't really need that, and that is what we use the device tree for. Yeah, so let's talk about that now. Um, so the hardware description is what a device tree is for. You describe the hardware that you have. So you say essentially like what peripherals you have, uh, where they are found in memory and stuff like that. Um, there is a website for it, it's devicetree.org. Uh, the current version is 0.4. Uh, the website for some reason still says 0.3, I think it's not yet up to date, but it's actually 0.4. If you go deeper, you will see that. Um, that standard actually came from the 90s. So it started with an IEEE standard 1275, just for reference. And so it derived to something which is actually not exactly the original purpose. So. There are a few things we need to know these days. Thing number one, in a device tree, you would need to know how much memory you have. So if you want to run a Linux kernel now, and you know you do this hackery setup that I did here with U-Boot and stuff, well, you would need to know, I need to put something in my device tree which tells the amount of memory, and you find that actually in my repositories. Um, another thing is, on the lag platform, I uh, learned that I need to supply a timer frequency. So I just have a guess that usually that would come from firmware like U-Boot. That might be overlaid into the actual Linux device tree. So, you know, they're sort of merged together and then the operating system knows some things which only the firmware could know before it. So that is the less portable part. It's a bit hard to understand this stuff, but you know, if you Spend some time in this space, um, you, we will figure this out. So 
yeah, I, I call it augmentation here. You could also call it merging or whatever. So what I'm essentially saying is there are different device trees which now sort of need to put together, or at least in part. So uh, this here is where I found this uh, patch which was talking about the uh, timer frequency. So, you know, otherwise I got to divide by zero error because it was initialized as a zero value. So, yeah, sometimes you might just get stuck. Um, there is something I found. It's uh, in the Linux kernel. You will find this here in the sysfast system. It's called kernel debug devices deferred. So the devices in there are the ones which are actually not yet running. So, like, you have your device tree. You're declaring dependencies now. You're saying, hey, if you want to run this hardware, you actually need to set up some other hardware first before me. Um, yeah, in, in this case, it was a power supply. I was, you know, missing the declaration of that power supply. I didn't even know about that uh, back in the days. It was actually just two months ago, or maybe one and a half. Um, it was even the wrong guess anyway, so, yeah, I actually needed to beep around on the uh, board with a multimeter, um, and then I could figure out the real thing. So, yeah, device trees are really nice. Um, I, I think they could actually be checked a bit more at build time, except, you know, for these minor differences that we have, which come from the firmware, and, you know, the kernel will not know about it. So, yeah, we, we need to figure this out. We could think about fallbacks, like, for example, the divide by zero error. It doesn't really make sense to, you know, by default, divide by zero. So, you literally have actually a bug in the code. Could also be defaulting to just the number one. Not too sure. Something to explore. Um, there were actually lots of interesting talks about device trees, like some six, seven years ago or something, um, which you might want to look into if you're interested in that stuff. Uh, what Frank Rowan, for example, did. He had some very, very nice ideas, which uh, unfortunately never made it into the public for some reason. I don't know. But yeah, if you want to look into that, highly encouraged. And the device tree is actually a lie. <laughs> so I already told you the sort of dependencies, right? So if you have it, what is the definition of a tree when we talk about structures? So a tree is a graph which has no circularities, right? So you always just go one way. So if you now say, okay, I'm, I'm this node down here, and now there is some other node up there. Now if you declare a dependency that way, you no longer have a tree, because somehow you have a circle now. So. Your hardware is also actually not really a tree. It's a sort of a bit of a tree, so it's mostly like a tree, but it's essentially a lie. So there are things like clocks, interrupts, GPIO pins, power supplies. They run all over the platform. So those are the ones that actually connect everything and power everything. So you need to be aware of this stuff. Now, in the device tree, there are sometimes very loose strings to define that. And one of them is, for example, called file supply. And that is what I messed up, uh, you know, when I was trying to write my own device tree. And I had a reference to something I hadn't declared. And, well, it could technically be checked, but then again, it wasn't. And, you know, I just get errors at runtime. Um, there is something which is called p-handle, which is then, you know, what those uh, references actually describe. Um, yeah, also highly encouraged to look into that. I would like to build something which visualizes device trees because it's very really hard to, you know, just look at thousands of lines of, well, sort of declarative code. Um, so yeah, if you uh, want to help me with that, bump into me. Um, now, just a few more uh, hints. So there is one thing I learned with power supplies. Um, I found this platform here, so this is actually the thing I, I have right before me. And, well, we have the SOC here. And I figured, if I want to talk Ethernet, which is behind this here, this is the Ethernet Phi, and then here we have the transformer, there is actually something in between, and that is called this AXP something. It's behind this chip here, which you cannot read at this point. But anyway, this is actually the power supply. So you might see there are some coils around it and stuff. So I actually had to configure this chip to give power to this device, to give power of some components in this here, which is our main SOC. And that was everything I needed to be able to go this way and talk to the Ethernet. 
Yeah, it's, it's a bit tricky to figure this out. So sometimes you might actually need a multimeter. So I actually did that. I attached to uh, one of the pins here, which is for the power supply, and then you know went all around this chip here. Well, not fully, because we're lucky. We have the pinouts here, right? So I could just go to the uh, pins, which you know would actually be sensible. So yeah, I, I would now do a, a full stack um, firmware-less demo. So when I say firmware-less, I mean I don't have any persistent firmware on my device. I would just supply something which does the DRAM in it, just like you know the U booted earlier. And uh, well, then we would see the whole thing come up. So let's see if we can actually get this going. So I will do the same trick again that I did before. Uh, I will run a very certain script. Uh, which I think I have here. Yes, this one. So I will keep this held again. Okay, so what is now going to happen is, well, the same dance as before. So we get our DRAM in it. We see YOLO again. YOLO means good. Um, now it's trying to talk to the chip another time. You will see this timeout thing here. Uh, we'll try it another time. Then we will see another timeout again. And then on the right-hand side, we will get a Linux kernel coming up. That takes a minute to transfer. So I'm going to do something else in the meantime. Um, I want to briefly talk about this, this whole setup here. So what I did, it really took quite some time. So what I'm demoing here, if you think, wow, this is elite cool hacking, it's literally not. I spent tons of days, hours, nights to get to this point. Okay, so this is not like something nobody could learn or something, you know, only some talented people can do. It's literally what you could all actually do if you just put enough time into it. Talk to the right people, maybe, because a lot of information that you know you actually need for this stuff. I can present everything in the 50 minutes that we have, and you know, sometimes you will just never figure things out until you actually talk to somebody. So I, I was lucky in a few cases where I actually had the right people. All right, two, one, and go. All right, so here we have our Linux kernel coming up. And well, what you can see here now is like all the drivers being registered, which belong to the platform. Um, there is now this CPU thing uh, there, and it's now trying to do DHCP. And I actually, um, I actually wanted to uh, set up some DHCP here, which had not worked, and I'm not sure why, but I will try again just for you. So I hope to see my Ethernet adapter here now over USB. And if so, I also get an IP address. And that means it should work. Password. OK, got it. So now I can run my DH client again. IPv6 equals false, I think. OK, so we're getting a lease in a bit. And then we can run the magical CPU command. So what I'm going to run now is a tiny program I've written in Rust at some point, uh, which just gives you some information about the platform. So the command I'm running on the left uh, said it didn't reach the host. I guess that is because I have a different address or something. Let's quickly try this one. Uh-oh, that's, that's also a bummer. Unreachable, unreachable, uh-oh hasn't worked. Uh, I see. Hang on a second. Demos and preparations. Um, who's to Okay, I hope this works now. Uh, we're going to try this again. Or maybe not. Okay, well, uh, the demo gods are not with me today. I'm sorry. Otherwise, I would, yeah, it should work now. 
Anyway, so yeah, we, we got a full Linux kernel set up anyway. So what we just did was we ran our own Linux kernel, so I compiled that myself without anything else. So it was literally the bare metal platform, and it didn't even run any uh, code from the firmware chip, well, from the chip that is holding the firmware on this device, right? So I just put all of that over USB. Okay. Um, now, I think we still have like one minute. <laughs> so let's briefly talk about this. So these days we actually have small computers everywhere, right? So like lots of uh, weird devices like fridges, uh, TVs, UFOs, you know, all of that stuff. Um, there are different kinds of chips in them. Some are called microcontrollers or MCUs. They're now getting a bit stronger. There are lots of different operating systems ending up on them, like Melis, for example, the last thing in the list here, is actually what is running on this device here. Um, microcontrollers are usually a bit more open, so if you, know, you search for something like STM32, for example, you find a lot of documentation. If you want to get one for free, if you heard about the Wettersonde in Germany, um, you know, it's like these weather balloons which uh, have some uh, <laughs> measurement devices on them. Um, if you know how to hunt them down, you can get one of those devices for free, just like uh, one of our friends in our hackerspace is actually doing in Bochum. And, well, he's currently working on Rust firmware for it. Um, hardware keeps changing a bit. Maybe not really. Maybe, maybe it does. There is something uh, now which is called AMP or asymmetric multiprocessing. So you have different processor cores, you know, which uh, are slightly different. One is more like a microcontroller. One is more like an application processor. And there are many examples of that. And now there is also this corresponding project, OpenAMP project. Go check that out if you want to hack on more recent hardware because that will definitely help you. The Raspberry Pi was already similar. It was, you know, essentially a GPU with some lag cores behind it. So it really just started on the GPU, from what I understand. Um, be a bit more careful, because AMP means we also get a larger attack surface, especially if we run different systems. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to skip this part now. So here are some related talks. So this is mostly for the recording, so you can also look at these uh, other URLs. And yeah, with that, I want to thank you for listening and, well, go and hack the gadget. And I even have a sign for it, I think. There. All right, thank you for the talk. Um, unfortunately, we have, don't have time for questions. Um, if people want to talk to you about this stuff, uh, where do they find you? Well, I'm still here until today, late afternoon. Just find me. Uh, I will mostly be I know, browsing around. If you see me, just say hi and ask me whatever you want to know. Uh, otherwise, I'm in the hacker spaces in Essen and Bochum. And, well, um, you can also find me in all of those places here. Thank you.